So next going to introduce Dr. Uh, Catherine Pat Hobeta, um, who's been doing her PhD in St. Andrews, but uh, she's now going to give you uh, an overview of the other Belongo. Okay. To, um, do my, do my, let's just press the uh, on. Hello everyone. So you've just heard all about the Bodongo Trail and what I'd like to do is introduce you to the site that Bodongo here is named for, which is the place that I have been lucky enough to work for about seven years and call pretty much home for the last four or five. And that's the Bodongo Conservation Field Station in Uganda. We're based up on the northeast corner of Uganda in East Africa, so this is Congo and Lake Albert. And we're based in a forest reserve there that was once part of a massive East African forest block, but that for a very long time has been fragmented under human pressure. And it's about 500 kilometers square that's left where we're working in. It was an incredibly rich resource for logging for many years. So in the early 1920s, sawmills opened up there to take out mahogany, cynometra, the Royal Albert Hall down in London is Bodongo Sinometra. Um, and for 60 years, the forest was logged, logged systematically. But um, eventually, those kind of supplies became exhausted. And in 1990, the sawmills that were there shut down. And we were able to come in and set up the field station. So this is camp. We live inside the forest a couple of kilometers in. We've got accommodation for 12 researchers. We have a permanent field staff, some of which live on site and some of which live off site. We have a laboratory, a library, hot showers if someone remembers to light a fire under the water tank, a solar power kitchen and occasional sporadic internet. And this is the forest where we are. So as I said, the forest was heavily logged. So we're in a secondary rainforest environment and it's the natural habitat for thousands of species. But we've been particularly interested for many years obviously in the primates and perhaps a slightly ironic side effect of the forest having been logged for quite that long is that by taking out those massive climax cynometras and mahoganies, what was left was a particularly high proportion of fruit trees and ficus trees. So that means we have very dense primate numbers in the forest. We have a couple of prosimians, the potos and the bush babies, four monkeys, so baboons, colobus, black and white colobus, uh, blue monkeys and red tails, and of course we have our species of great ape, which are our chimpanzees. So, uh, the forest itself contains around 600, 600 individuals, and they're split into different communities. Um, Vernon Reynolds, our founder, went out originally in the 1960s, at the same time as people were going into Gombe and into other sites. Fortunately, in Uganda, the political instability meant that he had to come out, and it was only in the late 80s when he returned and realized just what a crisis was going on there that in 1990 he took the opportunity to set up the field station in response to try and instigate research and conservation practices. Um, we've worked with them for 20 years now, well more than 20, 22 now, and they're incredibly well habituated. It really is a wonderful site to work at for a wild site, because we now have multiple generations of young chimpanzees who are born to habituated mothers. And that means that they're born into an environment where not only are they not necessarily not afraid of us, but we're really not that interesting to them. Apart from a couple of boisterous youngsters, generally they ignore the very strange people that walk around the forest and trip over things and fall into army ant nests. And they go about their normal daily life, which is the perfect thing for research for us. Uh, it's a large community and it's obviously a natural population, so we have 81 individuals distributed over different age groups and both sexes. Um, and we have a research grid, not that they particularly necessarily use that very often, but it's over about six kilometers square, so we can follow them over most of their range and off-site if we need to. Being a 21st century research station, we have both a website and a blog, if anyone wants a bit more information about us, but we're going through very quickly today, so I shall flip forward. Now, Bodongo Forest represents two very different things. It is a unique long-term resource for really high international caliber research, it is also a source of timber feud, fuel and food that is critical for the local populations around there. Um, Vernon recognized in the early days that it was only going to be with the support and trust of the local communities that we were going to have any chance of a long-term conservation strategy for this forest and all of the species that are dependent on it. So it really is a center that from the, from the very beginning, research and conservation have been tied in together and they both feed into each other naturally, which is what I'll hope to show you. 
So for conservation examples, one of the earliest things we set up was an ex-panthers project. Um, people from the local village meet as a scarcity in rural Uganda and they set tiny little wire snares, little pieces of wire that catch small antelope in the forest. Very sadly, as well as killing the antelope, they also catch the hands of our chimpanzees and they can cause really massive mutations, sometimes um, permanent disability, even amputation. Um, and it's a massive problem in the forest, see that chimps agree with me, it's an important issue for conservation. Um, now what we did was we employed some ex-hunters to go into the forest room and remove those snares. Obviously they're the guys that um, are putting them in in the first place, they're the best people to take them out. But we can't employ everyone that way, so while that was incredibly successful and they were taking out hundreds of these snares a month, um, what we did then is expand the project. And if hunters in the village sign a contract, they're enrolled in a pig and goat breeding pro program so that they then, um, in exchange for no longer hunting in the forest, still maintain a source of nutrition for their family and a source of income for their family. And that has been very successful and we see that from the fact that the older chimpanzees, it's about 30 or 40 percent of our adults have permanent disabilities, but with our younger chimpanzees it's much fewer. So with the constant vigilance of these guys, we really are making a massive difference. One of our other conservation projects, that's a more recent one, is we are now the Ugandan Centre for Chimpanzee Health Monitoring. And what we do is we take young vets who are being trained in the city and we bring them up to camp to train them in what it really takes to become a wildlife vet. And this is a classic example of, again, a very important project where um, it's really the integration of research and conservation here. So it's techniques like hormone analysis, thermal imaging, um, all of those things that started off as being research projects can be used as incredibly powerful tools for health monitoring and those two things can feed into each other. But of course we are also a research centre, um, we have a permanent field team and we have long-term databases over 20 years of wild chimpanzee behavioural data. Um, we are also multidisciplinary, we are about so much more than the chimpanzees, people come to study lichen diversity, amphibians, uh, all the different primates, even uh, carbon trading is now a very big one, understanding different kind of avian diversity and different forest types, so we really are about more than the chimps. But I, although I start as a monkey person, I'm a chimp person. So in terms of research, I'll just run quickly through a couple of the exciting projects we've got going on at the moment. One thing that many of us have been collaborating on over the years is a sort of origins of language focus. And really what we can do there is look at chimpanzee communication and human language and look for areas of overlap basically to see what kind of cognitive skills and abilities are present in both of those communication systems and can we trace that back through our evolutionary tree to see at what point those different kind of cognitive skills might have emerged in our ancestry. What's absolutely critical from addressing questions from an evolutionary perspective is that we have this naturalistic data. The chimpanzees live in massive groups. They fission and fuse, they range over kilometers, they communicate over kilometers in a dense forest, they hunt, they try to kill each other on occasion, they sneak females away for consortships from other males. It's all the kind of rich behavioral data that you just can't ever really recreate in captivity. And it is so important that if you want to study something from an evolutionary perspective, you have an understanding of the environment in which that behavior is adapted and evolved. So, over the years, we've gone from studies of chimpanzee vocalizations, observational ones, experimental ones. You'll hear more this afternoon about some of the really innovative playback methodologies people are using to unpick exactly what's going on in the vocal repertoire. Um, I was able in my PhD work to take the area of gestural communication, which had been so productive in captivity, and take it out to the wild to do the first wild study of gestural communication in great apes. And one thing that I've now been able to take forward in my postdoctoral work and that I think is really exciting is the fact that obviously we don't and the chimps don't gesture or talk or vocalize in isolation. None of those things happen separately. It is an integrated system of communication. And so what we're doing now is pulling all of those strands together, all of that experience from all of that research and studying multimodal communication in wild ape. So the future is bright, the future is multimodal. Uh, and then finally, Moving on to what the next step is for the site. So, uh, one of the things that you'll see this afternoon when you go up to Living Links is that uh, one of the questions that's been incredibly important for research in our field is the question of culture or cultural differences within primates and our closest relatives. Um, and what you'll see up in Living Links is it's incredibly important to control for environmental differences when we're addressing those questions. Um, it's constantly dogged the wild research that um, one of the 
recurring criticisms is that you can explain away the behavioral differences between the different groups because of different environmental differences. So differences in the available food, differences in the available um, forest area in which they're in. So I have bugged and bugged and bugged and finally been given the fun headache of habituating a second community in Bodongo. Um, and that means that we really can open up just incredible new areas of research. Not only would we have two habituated groups in the same forest, so we don't have those environmental differences, we're also able to look at things like intercommunity encounters, um, female immigration, the kind of behaviours that we just can't study at the moment because we only have these isolated groups on their own, and it really just will be a game changer for the kind of research we can do out there in the future. However, habituating chimpanzees is not an easy job. Um, the ones um, at the Sonso group, it probably took about 10 years before reliable behavioural observations could be done. Maybe 15 or 16 years later, some of the rarer females were not particularly well habituated. So it is a slow process. And how do we go about doing that? Well, we started in January 2011. And we have a massive advantage at Sonso, which is that we're not habituating from scratch. We're not going into a new forest and setting up a new field site. We have the existing infrastructure of the Sonso base, and we also now have 20 years at Sonso and many decades of experience in chimpanzee behavior. So we're able to apply all of that knowledge to the habituation of new chimpanzees and use that in ways to maximize the speed of habituation while minimizing any negative effect on the chimpanzees themselves. So for example, we can do focal behavioral, oh, sorry, focal behavioral stress type data where we're basically able then to look at uh, does it matter if we've got two or three observers of the chimps? Does it matter if they stand next to each other or apart? All of those little ways in which we can really minimize our negative impact and at the same time monitor really from day one in a chimpanzee habituation project exactly what the effect is using anything from GPS data to phenology data, DNA and hormone sampling. It just really is kind of a new dawn for being able to habituate in a very different way. Um, we are um, incredibly lucky out at Tonso, um, well, out in Bodongo, in that when we were considering which group to habituate, we had an inkling that this group up on the northeastern border, we saw them quite often, we knew they were a big kind of stable group, and two of our females who we knew incredibly well, they were very well habituated, they knew me through my whole PhD, um, disappeared towards just after my PhD was finished, and we kind of had a feeling they might have gone in that direction. They used to sneak off that way sometimes when the northeastern boys were around. And what we found is that they were there in the new community. So what's happened is that from day one, we've had individuals there who know us and who seem to be able, just by being comfortable around us, to have rapidly accelerated the habituation of this new group. So that instead of talking about decades to habituate them, within 18 months, we have 50 identified individuals, 28 of which have been DNA sampled and just sent them off. So we're very excited to find out the relationships between the two groups and who's going where. 23 of those are independent males, which is a massive community. I mean, to give you an idea, Sonso has 15 in total. We're still finding new boys. We have 12 females, six with offspring, two of which, which are very excitingly, both of our Sonso girls are pregnant. And what that means is we're going to have new babies born into this new community to habituated mothers. And that basically is hopefully just going to really speed up the pro progress in which we can work with this group. We have a master's student doing research there already. We're going to have a PhD student starting later in the year. And really, the future is looking incredibly exciting for research in the Bodongo Forest. So obviously, I don't do any of this work on my own. It's a massive team of people who work incredibly hard. And none of it would be possible without the funding that RZSS supports the site with. So thank you very much.